You may get paid for the video if you want. When you upload you may notice a couple of copyright notices on the video. Ignore them. The copyright claims on the video are fraudulent. If they stop you from getting paid for the video, dispute them. If you do not host this video on account you are not doing your part to get the message out there and you are part of the problem. Greetings world. We are anonymous. This following video focuses on the Federal Reserve problem of the United States. If you live in another country please know that this video is still meant for you. The problem will affect everybody around the world as the Federal Reserve is present in all countries. Watch this video and see what has happened to the United States so you can see what you and the world are up against. We must all unite together to fight our oppressors. Please pay attention. Every human on this planet is enslaved, whether they know it or not. This is not the crude and primitive slavery of ancient times. It does not rely on whips and shackles to keep the oppressed in their place. These tools have been rendered obsolete by much more sophisticated methods. That most of the enslaved are unaware of their condition and would in fact argue fiercely that they are free is a testament to the effectiveness of these invisible chains. You heard the expression, money makes the world go round. There's truth in that. Money is the prime motive for human labor in modern civilization. If you want food, shelter, and clothing, you must have money. And unless you're part of that tiny minority that has more money than they could ever spend in their lifetime, then you must work, beg, or steal for that money. That's why you get up in the morning and go to work, even if you hate your job. And that's why the specter of unemployment is more terrifying for most people than the prospect of spending 50 years of their life performing menial tasks within the confines of a fluorescent lit cubicle. Of course, in Western countries, some are fortunate enough to have pulled away from the brink and do not live in fear that their basic needs will be met, at least for now. And yet they keep spinning the hamster wheel. Why is that? Could it be because money and the bling that it buys have become symbols of status and prestige? Money offers an illusory form of social validation, but even those who are not caught up in distinguishing themselves by how much they accumulate still must acknowledge the social stigma that comes with poverty. The combination of these primal motivators, the need for food, shelter, clothing, and social validation, is a very powerful force. It's enough to drive humans to engage in all forms of activity, even to the point of harming themselves or others in the process. The accumulation of money is therefore an accumulation of social and psychological power, and those who control the creation of money control this power at its source. So who controls the creation of money? Well, in the case of the U.S. dollar, it's not the government. This shouldn't be an earth-shattering revelation. The fact that the Federal Reserve is a private institution owned by a cartel of the world's most powerful banks is quickly becoming common knowledge. Even the mainstream media doesn't deny it at this point. However, the full extent of what this means is only clear when you understand how the banking system really works. And unfortunately, this isn't something we're taught in school. Once you have it explained to you in simple terms, you'll understand why. Every dollar in circulation is loaned into existence by a bank. The process begins with the Federal Reserve when they loan out money to the U.S. government and to other entities. You've probably heard this talked about before, especially in regards to the interest rate on those loans, which the Federal Reserve raises and lowers depending on economic conditions. But what's never talked about in the mainstream is the fact that the Fed isn't actually loaning out money that they have. They are merely typing those dollars into existence on a computer. You may be inclined to believe that this money is based on some physical backing like gold, but you'd be mistaken. The Federal Reserve hasn't owned any gold since the 1930s. We don't. The Federal Reserve does not own any gold at all. We have not owned gold since 1934. Um, so we have not engaged in any gold swaps. When the Federal Reserve loans money to the U.S. government, 
The U.S. government gives the Federal Reserve government bonds in exchange. These bonds are simply written promises to pay back the money that was loaned to them with interest through taxation. So to be clear here, the government is taking out a loan from a bank that is creating that money out of thin air, and they're expecting you, the taxpayer, to cover that loan. The absurdity of this arrangement is even more obvious when you realize that up until 1913, the U.S. government created its own money and had no need for a bank to play the part of a middleman. That new money loaned out by the Federal Reserve enters circulation through the banks, accumulates in the banks, and in the end, the banks end up holding all the cards. Not necessarily for the reasons you may imagine. Contrary to popular belief, the majority of money in circulation isn't actually created by the Federal Reserve, but rather by the ordinary banks that businesses and individuals use for their checking, savings, and mortgages. How is this possible? Well, like the Federal Reserve, ordinary banks are allowed to loan out money that they don't have. There are, of course, restrictions. Banks are only allowed to loan out 10 times the amount of money that they actually have. So if Wells Fargo has $1,000, they can loan you $10,000, and they expect you to pay back that $10,000 plus interest. This is called fractional reserve banking. 75% of all money in circulation is created in this manner. Now, as bad as this may seem, this is really only the tip of the iceberg. Most banks structure payment plans so that for many years, you're paying almost nothing but interest and only start paying down the principal gradually. The result of this strategy is that in most cases, you pay far more in interest when you purchase a house than the house itself is worth. So here's the real question. If all money is created through loans, where does the money come from to pay for the interest? Let's say we reset the system to zero, loan $1,000 into existence and charge 7% interest. We now have a total of $1,000 in the system but we owe $1,000 plus interest, and that's more. The interest ensures that there's always more debt than money in circulation, because the money to pay the interest doesn't exist, never has, never will. This would be obvious if there was only one loan being issued to one person in this manner, but when performed on a global scale, the reality is hidden, and is transformed into a game of musical chairs where the person ending up without a seat faces bankruptcy and financial ruin. Because every dollar in existence is tied to a debt, this creates an unseen force that draws those dollars back to the banks, kind of like gravity attracts a physical object to Earth. The catch here is that it's the labor of the people that moves that money. Every hour that you work to pay back a loan or to keep the government from throwing you in jail over income taxes is an hour worked for the banks. The total receipts from personal income taxes just barely covers the interest on the national debt. And even the principal for that debt all ends up back in the hands of the banks. And remember, that bank created that money out of nothing. Once you understand that the money that banks loan out isn't actually an asset, but is in fact a piece of legal fiction, it should be clear that you're working for these banks for free. This is a cleverly disguised form of slavery. If you manage to pay your monthly payments, then you are a successful slave, and you are allowed to keep the material comforts that come with that status. But if for some reason you fail to make those monthly payments, then the bank or the IRS comes to take your house, your car, and anything else you have of value. And if somehow, even with this enormous financial advantage, the banks still get themselves into trouble, you, the taxpayer, will be forced to bail them out. No matter what, the banks win. To say the game is rigged is an understatement. You might be inclined to think that if you live outside the United States and you don't use dollars, then this situation has no bearing on your life. But you would be wrong. The dollar is both the world reserve currency and the only currency in which oil is sold on global markets. This is often referred to as the petrodollar status. This means that wherever you live, whether your country is an oil exporter or an oil importer, you are affected. If your country is an oil importer, then you are affected by the fact that in order to keep your country running, you have to acquire dollars. To acquire those dollars, you have to send goods and services to the United States or to someone else who did. 
Likewise, if your country is an oil exporter, you are affected by the fact that you send your oil to the U.S. in exchange for this debt-based money. You are exchanging something of real and tangible value for digits on a screen. And if for some reason the leadership of your country grows tired of this arrangement and tries to pull off the dollar, you'll quickly find the United States military at your doorstep ready to open up a can of democracy on you. Iraq learned this the hard way when they switched their oil sales to euros in 2000, and Libya when they tried to organize a gold-based currency for Africa. Debt-based money is a masterpiece of social engineering, the ultimate tool of the ruling elite. Yet in reality, the whole thing is nothing more than a construct of belief. Our chains are the chains of the mind, and the path to freedom must also begin in the mind. If we want a better future for our children and grandchildren, then we must work right now to reach a critical mass of awakening. So in case you missed it, the Federal Reserve's only job was to issue paper currency and back up that money with gold, making each dollar refundable for gold. But what they did was they stole the gold, then printed a bunch of fake money out of thin air backed by nothing and loaned it out at high interest. They collected around $3 for every one fake dollar they produced, and they did this scam with every dollar ever made in the US. You never knew about it because they collected the interest through taxes. It was an invisible scam. This scam put you and your children in a $19 trillion debt, making your children debt slaves forever. The following video will demonstrate how much these banksters stole from the world. We are considered the 99% in the video. They, the banksters, are considered the 1% in the video. Pay attention. There's a chart I saw recently that I can't get out of my head. A Harvard business professor and economist asked more than 5,000 Americans how they thought wealth was distributed in the United States. This is what they said they thought it was. Dividing the country into five rough groups of the top, bottom, and middle three 20% groups, they asked people how they thought the wealth in this country was divided. Then he asked them what they thought was the ideal distribution. And 92%, that's at least 9 out of 10 of them, said it should be more like this. In other words, more equitable than they think it is. Now that fact is telling, admittedly, the notion that most Americans know that the system is already skewed unfairly. But what's most interesting to me is the reality compared to our perception. The ideal is as far removed from our perception of reality as the actual distribution is from what we think exists in this country. So ignore the ideal for a moment. Here's what we think it is again. And here is the actual distribution, shockingly skewed. Not only do the bottom 20% and the next 20%, the bottom 40% of Americans barely have any of the wealth. I mean, it's hard to even see them on the chart. But the top 1% has more of the country's wealth than 9 out of 10 Americans believe the entire top 20% should have. Mind-blowing. But let's look at it another way, because I find this chart kind of difficult to wrap my head around. Instead, let's reduce the 311 million Americans to just a representative 100 people. Make it simple. Here they are. Teachers, coaches, firefighters, construction workers, engineers, doctors, lawyers, some investment bankers, a CEO, maybe a celebrity or two. Now let's line them up according to their wealth. Poorest people on the left, wealthiest on the right, just a steady row of folks based on their net worth. We'll color code them like we did before based on which 20% quintile they fall into. Now let's reduce the total wealth of the United States, which was roughly $54 trillion in 2009, to this symbolic pile of cash. And let's distribute it among our 100 Americans. Well, here's socialism, all the wealth of the country distributed equally. We all know that won't work. We need to encourage people to work and work hard to achieve that good old American dream and keep our country moving forward. So, here's that ideal we asked everyone about. Something like this curve. This isn't too bad. We've got some incentive as the wealthiest folks are now about 10 to 20 times better off than the poorest Americans. But hey, even the poor folks aren't actually poor, since the poverty line has stayed almost entirely off the chart. We have a super healthy middle class with a smooth transition into wealth. And yes, Republicans and Democrats alike chose this curve. Nine out of ten people, 92%, said this was a nice, ideal distribution of America's wealth. But let's move on. 
this is what people think America's wealth distribution actually looks like. Not as equitable, clearly, but for me, even this still looks pretty great. Yes, the poorest 20 to 30 percent are starting to suffer quite a lot compared to the ideal, and the middle class is certainly struggling more than they were, while the rich and wealthy are making roughly a hundred times that of the poorest Americans, and about ten times that of the still healthy middle class. Sadly, this isn't even close to the reality. Here is the actual distribution of wealth in America. The poorest Americans don't even register. They're down to pocket change. And the middle class is barely distinguishable from the poor. In fact, even the rich between the top 10 and 20 percentile are worse off. Only the top 10 percent are better off. And how much better off? So much better off that the top 2 to 5 percent are actually off the chart at this scale. And the top 1%, this guy, well, his stack of money stretches 10 times higher than we can show. Here's his stack of cash, restacked, all by itself. This is the top 1% we've been hearing so much about. So much green in his pockets that I have to give him a whole new column of his own because he won't fit on my chart. 1% of America has 40% of all the nation's wealth. The bottom 80%, eight out of every ten people, or eighty out of these hundred, only has seven percent between them. And this has only gotten worse in the last twenty to thirty years. While the richest one percent take home almost a quarter of the national income today, in 1976 they took home only nine percent, meaning their share of income has nearly tripled in the last thirty years. The top one percent own half the country's stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. The bottom 50% of Americans own only half a percent of these investments, which means they aren't investing. They're just scraping by. I'm sure many of these wealthy people have worked very hard for their money, but do you really believe that the CEO is working 380 times harder than his average employee? N not his lowest paid employee, not the janitor, but the average earner in his company. The average worker needs to work more than a month to earn what the CEO makes in one hour. We certainly don't have to go all the way to socialism to find something that is fair for hardworking Americans. We don't even have to achieve what most of us consider might be ideal. All we need to do is wake up and realize that the reality in this country is not at all what we think it is. In 1945, the Bretton Woods Agreement established the dollar as the world reserve currency, which meant that international commodities were priced in dollars. The agreement, which gave the United States a distinct financial advantage, was made under the condition that those dollars would remain redeemable for gold at a consistent rate of $35 per ounce. The United States promised not to print very much money, but this was on the honor system, because the Federal Reserve refused to allow any audits or supervision of its printing presses. In the years leading up to 1970, expenditures in the Vietnam War made it clear to many countries that the U.S. was printing far more money than it had in gold. And in response, they began to ask for their gold back. This of course set off a rapid decline in the value of the dollar. The situation climaxed in 1971 when France attempted to withdraw its gold and Nixon refused. On August 15th, he made the following announcement. I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. The United States. This was obviously not a temporary suspension, as he claimed, but rather a permanent default. And for the rest of the world who had entrusted the United States with their gold, it was outright theft. In 1973, President Nixon asked King Faisal of Saudi Arabia to accept only U.S. dollars as payment for oil and to invest any excess profits in U.S. Treasury bonds, notes, and bills. In return, Nixon offered military protection for Saudi oil fields. The same offer was extended to each of the world's key oil-producing countries, 
And by 1975, every member of OPEC had agreed to only sell their oil in US dollars. The act of moving the dollar off of gold and tying it to foreign oil instantly forced every oil importing country in the world to start maintaining a constant supply of Federal Reserve paper. And in order to get that paper, they would have to send real physical goods to America. This was the birth of the petrodollar. Paper went out, everything America needed came in, and the United States got very, very rich as a result. It was the largest financial con in recorded history. The arms race of the Cold War was a game of poker. Military expenditures were the chips, and the US had an endless supply of chips. With the petrodollar under its belt, it was able to raise the stakes higher and higher, outspending every other country on the planet, until eventually US military expenditures surpassed that of all other nations in the world combined. The Soviet Union never had a chance. The collapse of the communist bloc in 1991 removed the last counterbalance to American military might. The United States was now an undisputed superpower with no rival. Many hoped that this would mark the beginning of a new era of peace and stability. Unfortunately, there were those in high places who had other ideas. Within that same year, the US invaded Iraq in the first Gulf War. And after crushing the Iraqi military and destroying their infrastructure, including water purification plants and hospitals, crippling sanctions were imposed which prevented that infrastructure from being rebuilt. These sanctions, which were initiated by Bush Sr. and sustained throughout the entire Clinton administration, lasted for over a decade and were estimated to have killed over 500,000 children. The Clinton administration was fully aware of these figures. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. Worth it. Ms. Albright, what exactly was it that was worth killing 500,000 kids for? In November of 2000, Iraq began selling its oil exclusively in euros. This was a direct attack on the dollar and on U.S. financial dominance, and it wasn't going to be tolerated. of the mainstream media began to build up a massive propaganda campaign claiming that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and was planning to use them. In 2003, the U.S. invaded, and once they had control of the country, oil sales were immediately switched back to dollars. This is particularly notable due to the fact that switching back to the dollar meant a 15-20% to 20 loss in revenue due to the euro's higher value. It doesn't make any sense at all unless you take the petrodollar into account. So now you can see we really did go to war just to keep this Federal Reserve petrodollar scandal going. And if you think our country didn't commit 9-11 to go to war, do a little research on Operation Northwoods. It was a plan to fly multiple planes into real towers with real people, to go to war with Cuba. Congress signed off to do this act of terrorism. All branches of military did as well. The government kills for the banks. Our country is ran by the banksters. To preserve our independence, we must not let our rulers load us with perpetual debt. We must make our choice between economy and liberty or profusion and servitude. I place economy among the first and most important of Republican virtues, and public debt is the greatest of the dangers to be feared. 
It is incumbent on every generation to pay its own debts as it goes. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their money, first by inflation and then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of their property until their children will wake up homeless on the very continent their fathers conquered. The Federal Reserve made so much profit from this money scandal they were able to literally control the government. They meet every year with politicians presidents and many corporate giants where they control everything behind closed doors. These people control everything. This meeting is called Bilderberg Group. The Federal Reserve bankers are what are commonly referred to as the Illuminati. This is not a conspiracy. Past presidents have warned you many times this is not a conspiracy. We are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. What's happening? Where am I? I believe perhaps you understand now, Bob, but you are afraid. JFK, Hartman, what does this have to do with my house and my dog? Oh, okay, that's enough. I, I want to go home now. This is the last president to stand up to the Fed. You must see. On June 4, 1963, President Kennedy signed Executive Order 11110. This executive order empowered the U.S. Treasury to issue real money without the Fed. It would have worked. Kennedy's plan to dismantle the Federal Reserve machine had begun. But six months later, John F. Kennedy went to Dallas and never returned. No way. No way they could do that. The new president, Lyndon Johnson, threw out Kennedy's order. And since JFK, no president has dared confront the secret powers behind the Federal Reserve. Just how rich and powerful is Lord Evelyn Rothschild? Historically, the Rothschild family wealth was hidden in underground vaults. The Rothschild secret financial records were never audited and never accounted for. Their family commissioned biographies give the illusion that their family fortune has dwindled. But researchers estimate their wealth at close to $500 trillion, more than half the wealth of the entire world. Besides their many castles, palace mansions, wineries, racehorses, and exotic resorts, the Rothschilds bought Reuters in the 1800s. Reuters then bought the Associated Press, which selects and delivers the same news stories to the entire world, day after day. They have controlling interest in three major television networks and easily avoid media attention since they own it. They also fix the world price of gold on a daily basis and profit from its ups and downs. Over the centuries, the Rothschilds have amassed trillions of dollars worth of gold bullion in their subterranean vaults and have cornered the world's gold supply. They own controlling interest in the world's largest oil company, Royal Dutch Shell. They operate phony charities and offshore banking services where the wealth of the black nobility and the Vatican is hidden in secret accounts at Rothschild Swiss banks, trusts, and holding companies. Although Evelyn Rothschild looks like a harmless gray-haired old man, make no mistake about it, Rothschild and his ancestors have hand-picked presidents, crashed stock markets, bankrupted nations, orchestrated wars, and sponsored the mass murder and impoverishment of millions.
Review time, partner! And breaking news. To all of you who don't like conspiracy theorists, all of y'all who don't like truthers, who want to call truthers crazy, your fun is over. Those days of you having the illusion of credibility are over. The truth prevails over your ignorance. The truth is universal. You can try to say, oh, truthers are white supremacists. How does that work? Uh-huh. Whatever you want to say. You've been demonizing 9-11 truthers all these years. You're demonizing Sandy Hook truthers. Well, if it was a real conspiracy, don't you think the media would talk about it? Don't you think it would be on the front page of the news? Don't you think? Well, if it was a real government conspiracy, why do you think they would let that be on the news? Because you know the news stations are bought off, bought and paid for. You know the news, they read off a script, right? You know the news reporters do that, right? No? No, you don't know that? No, I trust my news. They are more credible than you. You are just some truther. I watch the news and I get informed. You get informed, don't you? Those reporters, they give you exclusive information. Now, you don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. Well, if you filled up your gas tank lately, then you don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. And you don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you gas prices are on the rise. I know. President, earlier this year you told us you had ordered your administration to cease and desist on payments to journalists uh, to promote your agenda. You cited the need for uh, ethical concerns and the need for a bright line between the press and the government. Your administration continues to make the use of video news releases, which are prepackaged news stories sent to television stations, fully aware that some or many of these stations will air them without any disclaimer that they are produced by the government. Controller General of the United States this week said that raises ethical questions. Does it raise ethical questions about the use of government money to produce stories about the government that wind up being aired with no disclosure that they were produced by the government? Uh, there, there is a Justice Department opinion that says these, um, these pieces are within the law so long as they're based upon facts, not advocacy. And I expect our agencies to adhere to that ruling, to that Justice Department opinion. This has been a long-standing practice of the federal government to use uh, these uh, types of videos. The Agricultural Department, as I understand, has been using these videos for a long period of time. The Defense Department, other departments have been doing so. It's important that, the, that they be based upon the guidelines set out by uh, the Justice Department. Now, I also I think it'd be helpful if local stations then disclose to their viewers if that's you know that this was based upon a factual report and they chose to use it but evidently in some cases that's not the case so anyway to guarantee that's happening by including that language in the prepackaged report yeah i don't you know look, I mean, oh you mean a disclosure i'm george w bush and i well some way to make sure it couldn't air without the disclosure that you believe is so vital uh you know ken i mean there's a there's a procedure that we're going to follow and the local stations ought to, if there's a deep concern about that, ought to tell their viewers what they're watching. Conan O'Brien may be about to push the envelope on late night television. Conan O'Brien may be about to push the envelope on late night television. Conan O'Brien may be able to push the envelope on late night television. Conan O'Brien may be about to push the envelope on late night television. Conan O'Brien may be about to push the envelope on late night television. Conan O'Brien may be about to push the envelope on his late night television. Conan O'Brien may be about to push the envelope on late night television. Conan O'Brien may be about to push the envelope on late night television. Well, Conan O'Brien may be about to push the envelope on late night TV. Conan O'Brien may be about to push the envelope on late night television.
But for these anchors to ask no questions, do no fact checking, and hold no differing interpretation of the news they're delivering is not only absurd, it's downright dangerous. And certainly the, there were commentators and, and others, pundits at Fox News that were helpful to the White did House. And, and certainly, yes, yeah, certainly we got talking points say, to those call people. call Sean, call a Bill, call whoever. Did you do certainly, that as a regular thing? I, I, it wasn't necessarily something I was doing, but it was something that we at the White House, yes, were doing and getting them talking points and making sure they knew where we were so coming from. So you were from. giving them talking points. But, but I would separate the no, journalists. No, important. Yeah. You were using these commentators as your spokespeople. Well, certainly. I mean, certainly. I think that certainly. happens to both ways when people go on other networks as well that are, that are uh, favorable towards the Democrats and so well, nobody's forth. Nobody's ever fed me any crap like that, so I don't know what you're talking well, about. Well, you're, you're an you, independent-minded guy. I, I, thank you. Yeah. But I'm, aren't you a little embarrassed by the fact that your White House used a, a television network which is purportedly fair and balanced well, as I, your mouthpiece? I think everybody in this town uses people that are going to be helpful to their cause to try to shape the narrative to their network? advantage. I, again, I would separate the journalists because the journalists that I worked with uh, were people just like the rest of the White House press so corps who were trying use, to report the news. you wouldn't use somebody to sell stuff for but you'd use the nighttime guys. Yeah, I, I would I would separate that out, and certainly uh, you know, and then they'll say that that's because they agree with those views in the White House. Well, they didn't need a script, though, did they? Uh, well, probably not. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. In consumer news, economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Third time I've said that. I'll probably say it three more times. See, in my line of work, you got to keep repeating things over and over and over again for the truth to sink in, to kind of catapult the propaganda. Review time. Hot. And I am so tired of this deception right here. This is what got you in a chokehold. The left versus the right. Left wing versus right wing. Don't you know the wings are of the same bird? A little corrupt bird, Republican versus Democrat. They got you cheering for teams. They got you in this tribalism mentality. You don't even understand it. They screwing you over. I'm going to show you how it works in this video. Now, you get here, John McCain over here talking about, oh, how the government shutdown was bad. Then you get people to agree with him and say, oh, John McCain is actually speaking some sense. He's right. It's the Republicans' fault. The Democrats love this little interview because, you know, it makes the Republicans look bad and gives them a reason to cheer for the blue team. Yeah, you're cheering for the blue team. But you're getting screwed over with this Obamacare. You're going to get McCain saying it was a bad idea to shut down the government because they wanted to repeal Obamacare. And what you're going to do, replace it with Romney care, the same thing. That's where Obamacare came from, Romney care. You see what I'm saying? Either way it go, we would have had this same type of health plan. Guess who else had the health plan? Hillary Clinton. You see these New World Order compliant 
candidates. They are backed by Wall Street. You don't have a real choice unless you go outside the Republicans and Democrats. This is how they keep screwing you over. Let's get into the video. Thank you, Martha. You know, I've heard a lot of veterans uh, so emotional uh, to the point of tears uh, I I over this issue. Uh, talk to me She's about so how fake. you think this has been handled by the White House. Oh, I think it's been terribly handled by the White House. But uh, let's have a little straight talk, uh, Martha. Straight talk. They wouldn't have had the opportunity to handle it that way if we had not shut down the government on a fool's errand. That's when the Democrats start cheering. Go ahead. Get your cheer on that we were not going to accomplish. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the whole premise of shutting down the government was the repeal of Obamacare. Oh. I fought against Obamacare harder than any of the people who wanted to shut down the government. I bet you did. I, I campaigned all over this country in 2012 saying elect Mitt Romney and we'll repeal and replace Obamacare. But see, that's so dumb. Obamacare is the same thing as Romney care. See, it's all about getting you to cheer for the team. Check this out right here convinced that Republicans will win in November and we will regain our majorities in both the Senate and the House. Go ahead, Republicans. Start cheering. Why are you blinking like that? Why are you blinking like that? What's your problem? And we will win House seats right here in Arizona. We will lead in Arizona. Uh -huh. you get to the point this uneventful speech. And when we do, we will stop the out of control spending and tax increases and repeal and replace Obamacare. Oh. And they're cheering. But repeal and replace Obamacare means they're going to put in Romney Care, which is the same doggone thing. Think I'm lying. Think I'm lying. We're going to look at this later. But let me see. Here we go. Uh, Governor Romney said uh, this has to be done on a bipartisan basis. This was a bipartisan idea. In mm -hmm. fact, it was a Republican idea. Oh. And Governor Romney, at the beginning of this debate, wrote and said what we did in Massachusetts could be a model for the nation. And I agree that uh, the Democratic legislators in Massachusetts uh, might have given some advice to uh, Republicans in Congress about how to cooperate. Listen to him now. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we use the same advisors and they say it's the same plan. Wow, the same doggone plan. Let's look at this. There are some terrific Republican ideas. Uh, Mitt Romney in Massachusetts uh, has this initiated mandatory insurance uh, mandatory. Uh, so that everybody has to buy in, uh, but then the government helps out those who can't afford it. Those kinds of bold initiatives, uh, I think the Democrats have to put forward bold as heck. if, in fact, we uh, can credibly came, uh, claim that we can run the country uh, and not simply uh, criticize on the sidelines. Now, this is key. This is in 2006. You see, he's, he's praising this individual mandate, too. It's funny he's doing that. So either way it go, we would have had this Obamacare, Romney care plan. But remember, I said Hillary ran on that plan as well. Obama didn't seem to like the individual mandate. That's how he got elected. Well, one of the reasons that made him look good, because he said he wasn't for individual mandate. Let's check it out right here. Didn't represent her properly. They misrepresent her. Did they? And, and what do you say about that? Well, obviously, I think that they represented her position properly, which is, is that she supported in the past NAFTA, which has been pretty hard on Ohio. Uh, and we've had an ongoing Campaigning. discussion about health care. Both of us want to provide health care to all Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a slight difference, and her plan is a good one, but... Slight difference. Uh, this is the slight difference he's talking about. Check this out. She mandates uh, that everybody buy health care. She'd, she'd have the government force every individual to buy insurance. Which is what Obamacare is. And I don't have such a mandate because I don't think the problem is that the people don't want health insurance. It's that they can't. No, I don't want it. I, I don't want health insurance. Afford it. So I focus more on lowering costs. And uh, th this is a modest difference, but it's one that she's tried to elevate arguing that because I don't force people to buy health care that I'm not insuring everybody. Well, if things were that easy, I could uh, mandate everybody buy a house and uh, that, you know, and that would solve, uh, you know, the problem of homelessness. It, it doesn't. Uh-oh, watch out, y'all. He might do that next. So 
there you go. Obama with his lying self. Y'all need to stop with this. You're over here arguing, acting like you're against Obamacare, you Republicans. And they're talking about repeal and replace Obamacare with the same thing. What the heck is your problem? Get out of this tribalism mentality. And people who would say, oh, we need Hillary Clinton. Well, she down for the same plan. It's the same thing. It's the same scheme. And why in the heck do we have a president who not only tries to sell us on a product, but forces us to buy it and penalizes us if we don't? Precisely because the product is good, I want the cash registers to work. I want the, ch the checkout lines to be smooth. So I want people to be able to get this great product. Who is this guy? I don't know, but he seemed like a nice old man. Nice old man. No, this right here is David Rockefeller. This guy right here, you need to do some research on David Rockefeller. Feel free to do that whenever you get a chance. But people who know about this man right here, they know he is nothing but trouble. Rockefellers, come back. We don't want your new world order, you know? Mm -hmm. Leave Chile right now. Leave Chile. Mm -hmm. You are not... You're, you're killing a lot of people! You're killing a lot of people! Leave here! Leave Chile right now! Leave Chile! Leave Chile! We don't want your world government. Leave Chile right now. Leave Chile, okay? Leave Chile. Your family, your family is the most disgusting in the world, you know? Leave here, leave, leave. You also, you're a traitor to Chile. Mr. Agustin Edward, you're a traitor to Chile, okay? You're a traitor to Chile. What you're doing right now, okay? 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 You know everything, you know everything. You're participating with him. You're participating with him in this. Your world government will fail, okay? You heard what the man said. Leave Chile. Why was that man so mad at him? You want to know why? Because he knows the Rockefeller family is for the New World Order agenda. What is the New World Order agenda? Well, that is the plan of this secretive elite, this cabal, to bring about a one world government. And not only a one world government, but a one world currency. And not only a one world currency, but a one world religion to glue it all together, which would mean they would have total control. The small amount of people controlling the whole world has never happened before. What else is going on? Well, depopulation. These guys push for depopulation in third world countries. You can see here, Henry Kissinger. Depopulation should be the highest priority of U.S. foreign policy towards the third world. So what they're doing is systematically killing off large populations of third world countries. And they're working to bring America to third world country status. They control the banks. They control the money. They will do it. That is their plan. And eventually they want to have the population down to an amount where they can control all the people. But you know what? You don't even have to take my word for it. Uh, I had a friend, Nick Rockefeller, okay, who was one of the Rockefeller family. And he, uh, uh, when I was running for governor in Nevada, he came to me, introduced himself to me through an attorney. And uh, we became friends. We started talking about things. And um, 
I learned an awful lot from Mr. Rockefeller. And one of the things that we used to talk about was the ultimate plan of the banking industry, what they wanted to accomplish. And the goals of the uh, banking industry, not, not just the Federal Reserve System, but the private banks in Germany and England, all over Italy, all over the world, they all work together. They're all central banks. And they're, and they're all part of the Communist Manifesto. You know, central banking is one of the major planks of the Communist Manifesto. We talk about America being a capitalistic country, but yet at the same time we have a central bank that plans everything for us, right? And the graduated income tax is another plank of the Communist Manifesto, right? So right there you have two major planks of the Communist Manifesto that have been brought in because of the Federal Reserve System, okay? So uh, the ultimate goal that these people have in mind is the goal to um, create a one world government where everybody has an, R R an RFID chip implanted in them. All money is to be um, in those chips, right? There'll be no more cash. And this is giving me straight from Rockefeller himself. This is what they want to accomplish. And all money will be in your chips. And so, any, so not, instead of having cash, Anytime you have money in your, in, your, in your chip, they can take out whatever they want to take out whenever they want to. If they say you owe us this much money in taxes, they just deduct it out of your chip digitally. Total control. Total control. And if you're like me or you, and you're protesting what they're doing, they can just turn off your chip. And you have nothing. You can't buy food. You can't do anything. It's total control of the people. And that chip's connected to a database that has your purchasing records, what you do. What everything. You everything is in there, you know? And so they, they want a one world government controlled by them, everybody being chipped, all your money in those chips, and they control the chips and they control the people. And you become a slave. You become a serf to these people. That's their goal. That's their intentions. And if you look here, he even tells you this is what he is about. Some people believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I am proud of it. That's David Rockefeller telling you he wants this new world order. Well, he didn't say new world order. Oh, oh, so you need him to say new world order. Okay. All we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. See that? That's why you got to pay attention. But before we break it down, I want you to see this. You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go on. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the web. Number 322? <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, he's not the nominee. And, uh, but, uh, look, I look for... Are you prepared to lose? No, I'm not going to lose. You both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. 322? A secret number? Uh, there are all kinds of secrets. We had a worldview. Republican and Democratic presidents alike, from Harry Truman to George Bush, stood for freedom and stood for certain propositions that would make America strong and healthy and grow the middle class and shrink poverty and stand against communism. And after 1989, President Bush kept said, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders.
the affirmative task we have now is uh, is to actually um, uh, create uh, uh, a new world order. If you go outside the city of Atlanta, go east about 60 or 70 miles to the town of Elberton, and then go north on Highway 77 about 10 miles, you'll find off to the right what's called the Georgia Guidestones. It looks kind of like Stonehenge, these big, huge granite rocks set up there. This was done by a guy, we have a pseudonym, came in, paid cash, had this company set these things up in 1980. He called himself R.C. Christian, uh, but that's not his real name. It says it right on the stones, a pseudonym, false name. On these Georgia Guidestones, it gives the Ten Commandments for the New World Order. Ten Commandments for the New World Order. The, fir the first commandment was to maintain humanity under a half billion. I went there and looked at those things and said, now, hold on a minute. Today's population is six billion. They want to maintain humanity under one half billion. Looks like a lot of people got to die for their plan to work, which is, by the way, the plan... As Jacques Cousteau said, we'd have to eliminate 350,000 people a day. A third of a million people a day would have to be eliminated to save Mother Earth. Uh, Bill Clinton said we need to reduce the population of the Earth to one billion. There are a lot of folks who would like to reduce the population of the Earth. The Bible command is quite the opposite. America's place in the new world order should be. It's always been seen as the global policeman. But as you said before, you know, it's hard to see with all these military conflicts where the winner and loser lies. What, what should America be doing? I think globally? the global policeman should be the United Nations. And I don't think we should need one. I think we should uh, abuse courts uh, the way we do in, in civilian, uh, civilian life. It, 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 it's time to put war and conflict uh, armed conflict behind us and, and move on and start acting like civilized, educated human beings. Oh, you're so civilized, Ted. Let's look at your quote. A total population of 250 to 300 million people, a 95% decline from present levels would be ideal. That's Ted Turner, founder of CNN and New World Order supporter. You see, he donated $1 billion to the United Nations. This man is down for the depopulation agenda. He wants a one-child policy for 100 years, yet he got five kids. And you got to pay attention because these jokers will tell you that they selling out. And they do that just so it'll go over your head. So you'll be like, oh, well, they didn't really mean that. They're just being sarcastic. It's not that serious. But then at the same time, people be like, oh, well, I ain't gonna believe that unless they tell me. He telling you right here, we get Shaq admitting to the whole world that he's a Freemason and he is proud of it. What is that? What is that? That's a ring of my profession. You don't know nothing about that. Okay, well, can we get a close up on that? There it is. What? You don't know nothing about what is the profession? Yeah, which profession are you talking man. about? Ooh, that man so happy. Is it a legal profession? Of course it's legal. It's a ring of my profession. I'm trying to read it. Okay. Right, it's too many times. Ah! He's like, yep, I'm a Freemason. Ain't nothing you can do. Mason, are you a Mason? And all them jokers okay. around him know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> That's a secret serum. Well, you might as well put your pinky out when you drink your drink. Put your pinky out. Are you involved in the secret serum? Stop it. Everyone wears it. Anyway, the Clippers. The Clippers. That is impressive, Mr. O'Neal. I don't have a chance. Anyway, so the Clippers. Oh, yeah, I have four. Those he doesn't wear. Those he doesn't wear. The Clippers. Yeah, as I was blinded by success. Look at that man right there. That's impressive. I'm, I'm blinded by success. See, they know what the deal is when you're a Freemason. You know, they get all these movie roles and all these deals. Matter of fact, Shaq was on Grown Ups 2. It was one of the worst movies I have ever seen. Oh, my gosh. Terrible. Anyways, he on there. There go your boy Shaq. Shaq's a Freemason. Bring it right back to David Rockefeller. All we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. So they're going to bring out a problem and then they're going to offer a solution. One of their plans is to devalue the dollar so that it barely has any buying power. 
So then you go to the store, you can barely buy anything. You see the food on the shelf, but you can't afford it. What happens then? People start going crazy. People start to panic. Then people start robbing each other. People start killing each other. So then we need to bring in the police state. Oh, we're asking the government for help. And surely they are here to bring the order out of chaos, but it's not just any order. It is the new world order. And not only that, but they're going to bring about a one world currency to replace the old currency. And then they're going to bring it into a cashless society where you got to get the chip. All your money being on the chip. And also to glue it all together, the one world religion. Where these sellouts come to play, they are new world order compliant. They are here to sell you the agenda. They're going to let you know how cool it is to get a microchip in your arm. Some of y'all might think it's cool, but I know a lot of y'all don't like this type of stuff. So I'm just making sure you are aware of their agenda. But anyway, I've had people calling me saying they go out to their mailbox and they find a little red dot or a little blue dot on their mailbox and they wonder what the little red dot and blue dot is. Well, it's marking your mailbox by the government so when foreign troops come in here on us after martial law, if you have a red dot on your mailbox, they take you out immediately and shoot you right in the head. But if you have a blue dot, they take you to the FEMA camps being built by Halliburton right now to house 50 million Americans. They're building enough concentration camps in America by Halliburton that Cheney's getting rich off of, Vice President Cheney's getting rich off of, to put those with the blue dot on your mailbox in those concentration camps. Now, if you go out and you find a pink dot 
on your mailbox, that means that they believe you'll be a good slave and you're going to go along with the program and serve our international antichrist masters. So watch for that dot. Listen to this, folks. I was pulled to the side road, which was uh, uh, a new cut gravel dirt road in front of a business, a builder supply business. And the right side of the road was filled with, uh, which I thought was portable toilets. So I never looked at them that close. Same in color, maybe black, but which was an odd color. And I asked him about the, the field of black boxes. What, what were they? Because uh, I'd never seen anything like that. And, uh, and his statement was that if he told me, I would be one of few people in Madison, Georgia, that knew about them. And he says they're, they're uh, disposable coffins, I believe he told me. And he says uh, there's a hundred, at that time, he said there was 125,000 there. And the brother of the man that owns this field, that the government is leasing this field from, to store these disposable coffins, this brother has been, was given three years to set up temporary morgues around the country. Have you heard that the Department of Homeland Security has purchased 1.6 billion rounds of ammunition last year? I mean, that's going to cost millions and millions of dollars. Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't this country broke? I mean, you turn on the TV, you hear how we're laying off air traffic controllers, how people are going to die because of it. I mean, Harrison Ford is in a tizzy, and we're spending this much money on bullets? Do you know that 1.6 billion rounds of ammunition is enough to fight a 20-year war and still have bullets left over? My question is, who is the Department of Homeland Security planning to shoot? Do you realize that over the past couple of months, our government has tried to pass bills through Congress allowing them to arrest American citizens without due process? allowing them to kill American citizens without due process. And uh, it's got the five regions for the FEMA camps, and it talks about barricades and barbed wire and, 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 and armed guards, and uh, it, it says that they've built the camps and that now they need to get ready to staff them and that they need to be ready within a 72-hour period. And so I want to challenge everybody to call their friends and their families now and realize that the new economy is to put tens of millions of people we already have the biggest prison population in the world in in this in this archipelago this 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 giant chain of facilities all over the country the following video details the contents of a department of defense document entitled internment and resettlement operations also known as fm 3-39.40 the document is 325 pages long and it is signed by Joyce E. Morrow, Administrative Assistant to the Secretary of the Army. It was created in 2010, however, it has just been recently leaked to the public via the internet and can now be downloaded from multiple sources. In the description below, you'll find a download link for the document. I strongly encourage you to download it yourself and to verify everything that's being said here. The document outlines military procedures for internment and resettlement of civilians, and it describes the layout and the administration of these internment camps. It clearly states on page 38 that it applies within U.S. territory, and it specifically addresses the detainment of U.S. citizens, as is indicated by the identification procedures for new prisoners on page 146, which states that social security numbers are to be recorded alongside their photograph and fingerprints. Included in the list of organizations which may be involved in these internment operations are the Department of Homeland Security, FEMA, the Department of Defense, and the United Nations. On page 56, the document outlines the responsibilities of psychological operations officers within the camps, among which it states that a PSYOP officer develops and executes 
indoctrination programs to reduce or remove antagonistic attitudes and identifies political activists. On page 281, the document goes into more detail regarding the role of psychological operations within the camp, specifically in regards to pacifying the population and ensuring cooperation. On page 238, it gives the conditions for the use of deadly force in such camps. Among the justifications for lethal force, it includes to terminate an active escape attempt. That point right there should make it clear that these camps are not benevolent disaster relief type facilities. On page 244, the document calls for the use of snipers during riots to quote, scan a crowd and identify agitators and riot leaders for apprehension and fire lethal rounds if warranted. On page 260, it shows the basic layout for a facility focusing on detainment. It is depicted with interrogation areas, tribunal areas, and mortuaries. Each detainment facility is designed to hold 4,000 prisoners, and they are depicted with multiple levels of barbed wire separating compartments within the facilities, with a double barbed wire fence enclosing them, and watched over by 24 guard towers. On page 261, the document depicts the layout for what they call civilian resettlement facilities, which are designed to house 8,000 people. Though it uses the word resettlement, the plans show multiple levels of barbed wire dividing the sections of the facility, with double barbed wire fencing on the outside, as well as 16 guard towers. On page 262, the layout for facilities designed for what they call non-compliant prisoners is shown. These camps are designed to hold up to 300 prisoners, they have three interrogation centers, and are guarded by 13 guard towers. Now, if there's any question whether these plans are active or just theoretical, this should be settled by the fact that the U.S. Army has been running ads for job positions in these camps since 2009, and apparently, they're still hiring. Once again, if you look in the description, you'll find all the links you need to verify this information. It's important to note here that this document was created in 2010, which was under the Obama administration, and it predates the NDAA of 2012, which authorized military detainment of U.S. citizens. This clearly shows a long-term agenda at work. saying he's a military police and he says we've been sent footage before by military police and others so i want this footage of them in briefings openly talking about gun confiscations now that's now in the manuals that they're training to quarantine cities and towns and confiscate guns we've had navy seals on confirming it we have the documents we know that but footage not just in some army manual but footage could really really hurt uh, the folks that are uh, trying to covertly prepare the military for basically civil war. Brian, uh, obviously, uh, you've got to go back in right now. Tell us as much as you can and how we get this footage, but describe it for us. Okay, so I was in a briefing with uh, FEMA. FEMA runs my old unit. I'm actually out now. I got out in September of this year. Uh, they were talking about suspension of the Constitution, Second and Fourth Amendment rights being taken away, and I openly asked them, uh, are we going to take guns? He says no, but he says they will. It's clearly on the video. They will. Talking about the FEMA guys with us. Um, so that's the gist of the video. You could, uh, I'm filming the floor because it kind of startled me when they said that they're going to suspend the Constitution under martial law, which is pretty scary to me. Essentially, yeah, we pretty much at that time, you're... So you said that uh, martial law suspends our Second Amendment. So would, I'm not going to, but would you say we would take weapons from people? Yeah, that's what they do. President Obama today proposed something new, something called prolonged detention. Doesn't sound that bad, right? Prolonged detention. Did you ever see the movie Minority Report? It was based on a Philip K. Dick short story. It came out in 2002. It starred Tom Cruise, remember? He played a police officer in something called the Department of Pre-Crime. Pre-Crime is where people are arrested and incarcerated to prevent crimes that they have not yet committed. Mr. Marks. My mandate of the District of Columbia Pre-Crime Division. I'm placing you under arrest for the future murder of Sarah Marks and Donald Dubinos. Take place today, April 22nd, at 0800 hours, 4 minutes. No, I didn't do anything. You didn't do anything, but you're gonna. 
future murder. Creepy, right? Putting somebody in jail not for what they've done, but for what you're very sure they're going to do? There may be a number of people who cannot be prosecuted for past crimes. In some cases because evidence may be tainted. But who nonetheless pose a threat to the security of the United States. We're not prosecuting them for past crimes, but we need to keep them in prison because of our expectation of their future crimes. Al-Qaeda terrorists and their affiliates are at war with the United States, and those that we capture, like other prisoners of war, must be prevented from attacking us again. Prevented. We will incarcerate people preventively. Preventive incarceration. Indefinite detention without trial. That's what, that's what this is. That's what President Obama proposed today. If you strip away the euphemisms. One civil liberties advocate told the New York Times oh, today, quote, we've known this was on the horizon for many years, but we were able to hold it off with George Bush. The idea that we might find ourselves fighting with the Obama administration over these powers is really stunning. And it is stunning. As a psychiatrist, I remember very well the condemnation by the American Psychiatric Association of Soviet psychiatrists and the Soviet Union for their use of psychiatric techniques and psychiatric medications to control political dissidents. Sadly, shockingly, we in the United States have become those same oppressors. We now have a policy as exemplified by the FBI brochure from the Phoenix Office on Counterterrorism, which says people who are defenders of the U.S. Constitution against federal government and the U.N. and make numerous references to the U.S. Constitution should be monitored as potentially murderous and fanatical terrorists, by extension, should be considered mentally unstable. Department of Justice memo, which tells local police what should you be looking out for in kind of everyday terrorism prevention and terrorism watch uh, um, activities. And one of the things that is considered a potential terrorist risk is individuals who harbor doubts about the official story regarding 9-11. The memo adds 9-11 official story skeptics to the growing list of targets. No good and well that someday there could be a government in power that is shipping its citizens off for disagreements. There are laws on the books now that characterize who might be a terrorist. Someone missing fingers on their hands is a suspect according to the Department of Justice. Someone who has guns, someone who has ammunition, Someone who has more than seven days of food in their house. Can be considered a potential terrorist. If you are suspected by these activities, do you want to have the government have the ability to send you to Guantanamo Bay for indefinite detention? A suspect. We're not talking about someone who has been tried and found guilty. We're talking about someone suspected of activity. President Obama is now allowed to write in laws without consent from Congress, making us no different than a dictatorship. The president has just signed many executive orders that allows the government to take your assets, your loans, your children, transportation, and gives the government permission to put you into concentration camps and labor camps. If you do not believe me, here are the executive orders. Read them yourself.
Here we go. Executive Order 10990 allows the government to take over all modes of transportation and control of all highways and seaports. Executive Order 10995 allows the government to seize and control the communication media. Executive Order 10997 allows the government to take over all electrical power, gas, petroleum, fuels, and minerals. Executive Order 10998 allows the government to seize all means of transportation, including personal cars, trucks, or vehicles of any kind, and total control over highways, seaports, and waterways. Executive Order 10999 allows the government to take over all food resources and farms. Executive Order 11000 allows the government to mobilize civilians into work brigades under government supervision. Executive Order 11001 allows the government to take over all health, education, and welfare functions. Executive Order 11002 designates the Postmaster General to operate a national registration of all persons. Executive Order 11003 allows the government to take over all airports and aircraft including commercial aircraft. Executive Order 11004 allows a housing and finance authority to relocate communities, build new housing with public funds, designate areas to be abandoned, and establish new locations for populations. Executive Order 11005 allows the government to take over railroads, inland waterways, and public storage facilities. Executive Order 11051 specifies the responsibility of the Office of Emergency Planning and gives authorization to put all executive orders into effect in times of increased international tensions and economic or financial crisis. Executive Order 11310 grants authority to the Department of Justice to enforce the plans set out in executive orders to institute industrial support, to establish judicial and legislative liaison, to control all aliens, to operate penal and correctional institutions, and to advise and assist the President. Executive Order 11049 assigns emergency preparedness function to federal department and agencies, consolidating 21 operative executive orders issued over a 15-year period. Executive Order 11921 allows the Federal Emergency Preparedness Agency to develop plans to establish control over the mechanisms of production and distribution of energy sources, wages, salaries, credit, and the flow of money in U.S. financial institution in any undefined national emergency. It also provides that when a state of emergency is declared by the President, Congress cannot review the action for six months. The Federal Emergency Management Agency has broad powers in every aspect of the nation. General Frank Salzito, Chief of FEMA's Civil Security Division, stated in a 1983 conference that he saw FEMA's role as a new frontier in the protection of individual and governmental leaders from assassination and of civil and military installations from sabotage and or attack, as well as prevention of dissident groups from gaining access to U.S. opinion or a global audience in times of crisis. FEMA's powers were consolidated by President Carter to incorporate the National Security Act 1947 that allows for strategic relocation of industries, services, government, and other essential economic activities and to rationalize the requirements for manpower, resources, and production facilities. The 1950 Defense Production Act gives the President sweeping powers over all aspects of the economy. The Act of August 29, 1916 authorizes the security of the Army in time of war to take possession of any transportation system from transporting troops, material, or any other purpose related to the emergency. The International Emergency Economic Powers Act enables the President to seize the property of a foreign country or national. These powers were transferred to FEMA in a sweeping consolidation in 1979. Did Hitler get elected on Monday and start throwing people into ovens on Friday? No. 
It was a gradual process. The first thing that Hitler did was start to write newspaper articles. Every, everything that was going wrong was the Jews' fault. They're the ones that caused all these problems. Did the Jews write their own newspaper articles and go, I disagree? So then the Jews had to wear the Star of David so that we can tell who you are. Did they say, no, that's a violation of my property, privacy. I don't have to tell you. No. The Jews decided, well, it's a religious symbol. We love God. We should be proud to wear the Star of David. Eventually, the, Jew, the Germans came in and they broke all of the windows in all of the Jewish businesses in one weekend. The, the Saturday night was known as Kristallnacht, which is German for night of glass. Did the Jews rise up and say, now, damn it, you're violating my property. You shouldn't do that. No. Gosh, we don't want to make the Germans any madder than they already are. Don't piss them off. They've got guns. Eventually, the Germans are loading them up in the cattle trailers, in the, on the train. Where do you think you're going? On vacation? Where do you think they're going to take you? Well, now you're cold and naked and they're walking you into the ovens where you're going to go to mass execution. Is it time now to raise your hand and say, you know, I tend to disagree with all of this. Bang! You're dead. It's too late to complain. You should have complained at the beginning, when you at least had a chance. How bad do things have to get before you do something? Do they have to take away all your property? Do they have to license every activity that you want to engage in? Do they have to be throwing you on cattle cars before you start to say, now wait a minute, I don't think this is a good idea. How long is it going to be before you finally resist? The only way we can stop this is if we all unite together and fight it. People of the U.S. are waking up to the Federal Reserve scandal. And the powers that be are currently afraid of retaliation. And that is precisely why they trying everything they can to disarm us. You know how the media has been saying gun violence has been out of control and at an all-time high. They are not simply twisting the truth here or exaggerating. They are absolutely presenting lies to you. First off realize. Gun violence in the United States has always been shockingly low. And gun violence has dropped by 49% in the last 11 years. The already already absurdly low gun violence in America has literally dropped in half. In half. The fact they are saying that it is at an all-time high perfect demonstrates how biased the government and the media is. If this doesn't prove to you that they have an agenda, then nothing will. Do you remember how the media keeps repeating that there has been 74 school shootings since Sandy Hook? Those 74 shootings were not even mass shootings like they claim. Most were suicides and none of them even took place at a school. Not a single one. They are presenting lies to you America. When will you wake up? At some point you have to ask yourself why would the government fake 74 mass school shootings involving children? If they get our guns, we will lose the fight against them. And they will take away absolutely all of your freedoms and you and your children will be forever slaves. And don't forget they purposefully put you and your children into that debt. And because the Federal Reserve is present in all countries, the other countries of the world are next soon after. This plan is called the New World Order. It is the same New World Order the Vice President of the United States called for on national TV a month ago. He said we need to strive for and complete the New World Order. This is also the same New World Order President George Bush and President Kennedy said is our country's lifetime goal. And the same New World Order George Bush said on national TV said will happen no matter what we do, and we cannot prevent it. This has all been a long time plan. The Federal Reserve and their partners want complete control of humanity. We cannot let this happen. They want to rule over us, 
like kings and queens. And humanity will be forever lost to enslavement by a bunch of tyrants who have publicly admitted they want to kill off the majority of the population so the masses are easier to control. They are going to wipe your bloodline completely off of the earth. He'll tell you the order of things to happen. The enslavement will follow immediately after guns are taken away and you cannot fight back. If they cannot get the guns before the economic collapse, then they will wait until the economy collapses. When the economy collapses people will be starving. There will be looters and shootings. The government will insist on taking guns away to help, and as soon as the guns are taken away then we will fall into a complete dictatorship. Do not fall for it. Remember. They are the ones who caused the economic collapse to begin with. This is the same tactic used on Germans and it worked. So expect it. As soon as the economy collapsed and the masses were starving the German government asked the people to give up their rights and they listened. And then eventually the government was throwing the naked masses into intergiant burning hot ovens for mass execution. Do not give up your rights. Do not give up your guns. Fight back as they were the ones who caused the problem. Just so you know the people who are behind this Federal Reserve scam and New World Order, are the same ones who funded Hitler's campaign. Make no mistake, these people as brutal as Hitler himself, even more brutal, we will need an overall plan. We have come up with a perfect plan. This plan offers extraordinary possibilities. It will make for the most beautiful and free world you can ever imagine. If we are successful we can leave a much better for our children. A beautiful world. Watch every minute of the rest of the video. Do not skip a single bit of it, as it is all important. To understand the solution you must first understand the problem. The problem is government. Think for a second. What is government? Government is an establishment of power over the people, which can be purchased by large corporations or anybody with money. Why are we allowing corporations to write the laws? Can't you see how this can create problems? We must take the power and guns away from the government which will advertently take away the power and guns away from the corporations. And we need to take that power and weaponry and put it back in the hands of the people, not greedy corporations. These people want to put you into labor camps and death camps. These people have poisoned your children's water and food, enslaved your children. When will you wake up? We must get rid of government. The solution is anarchism. Anarchism is not what you think it is. Watch the rest of the video to understand what we are proposing. To you. Makes perfect sense. Okay. Anybody else want to throw anything out at us? Sir! Uh, I think you're an anarchist and you don't know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> do, we, do you hear me denying anything? <laughs> Many people, when they hear the word anarchy, think of chaos and mayhem. So, they assume that an anarchist must be in favor of disorder and violence. That is the complete opposite of the truth. Most objections and complaints about the anarchist or voluntarist philosophy are not actually about the philosophy itself, but result from people misunderstanding what the philosophy is all about. To illustrate a few points, we will use the example of two fictional islands. Authoritania, where there is a ruling class or government, and Anarchia, where there is no ruling class of any kind. We will use these islands to examine several common misconceptions about anarchism. Lots of people think anarchy means every man for himself, or survival of the fittest, or the absence of any social cooperation or organization. They think that anarchy means everyone has to be self-sufficient. This comes from the false assumption that some kind of government is necessary for any organization to occur. 
Whether it's part of a republic, a democracy, a kingdom, or a dictatorship, a ruling class issues orders called laws and punishes anyone who disobeys them. That is not cooperation. That's domination. It's one group forcing its will on another. Authoritarianism can be used to force people into organized patterns, but that does not mean that people are incapable of organizing their activities without being forced. The most productive and useful examples of organization that we see today are anarchistic in nature. No one was forced to build the grocery store you go to. No one was forced to produce or sell anything in it. Everyone involved in the vastly complex operation of growing your food, transporting it, displaying it in the store, and selling it to you, everyone involved participates voluntarily, working in exchange for money. You and all the other store customers choose freely which store to go to and what to spend your money on. This purely voluntary arrangement allows for an amazingly complex degree of organized cooperation without anyone being coerced to participate. In contrast, under government, a very small group of people comes up with an idea and forces everyone else to participate in it and provide for its funding with tax dollars. In the authoritarian version of a supermarket, the ruling class would tell people what to produce and how much, what prices to charge, and they would tell customers what they must buy and what they must pay. Anyone who did not comply with the centralized master plan would be punished in some way. That is how government does things. Which one of these would you prefer? Another common but incorrect assumption is that if there were no ruling class or no government, people would have no way of defending themselves against common criminals or foreign invaders. Again, this is simply not true. The government version of protection is inherently hypocritical. Governments will use their hired law enforcers to find and lock up some of the private thugs and thieves and prevent them from preying on people. But every ruling class gets the money for its operations by way of taxation, demanding money from its subjects and punishing those who don't pay up. Oddly, every ruling class insists that it needs to be able to forcibly control and extort money from people in this way in order to protect them from private criminals who might try to forcibly control and extort them. In contrast, if there is no government, people do not lose their inherent right to defend themselves from violence or to defend what they have from those who would take it. Every person has this right, and they also have the right to organize and cooperate with each other to exercise that right. Organizing for mutual defense does not require any government-granted laws or authority. No one wants to be attacked or defrauded, and everyone wants to feel safe. Whether each person takes this on himself or herself individually, or whether they hire and organize others to do it on their behalf, it can be done on a voluntary basis. Those who insist that government is necessary often claim that if there wasn't a government, then smaller private gangs would spring up to enslave and rob people. Organized crime gangs exist along with government, and most people do not understand the dynamics between them and how government enriches and empowers organized crime while appearing to fight it. Black markets enrich organized crime, and money allows them to buy government protection. There's no reason to think they would do as well in an environment of freedom where they would have fewer ways to make money and would be up against both individual and organized armed citizens. A criminal gang that's recognized as such has far less power than a gang whose aggression is perceived to be legitimate and proper. And that's the gang we call government. When thuggery is called law enforcement, and thievery is called taxation, and self-defense is called crime and terrorism, then even the widespread ownership of firearms can't do much to stop the aggression. 
Imagine a private gang trying to do the things that government does without the aura of authority and imagine how a well-armed population would respond to this. The gang would fail quickly and dramatically. Another concern that people have when they first consider the idea of a stateless society is that some people are truly malicious, destructive, and sociopathic. The concern is that these people would be free to do anything they wanted and no one would stop them. But this concern is again based on a basic misunderstanding of human nature. Wherever we have a government ruling class, we still have freelance thieves and thugs who are not deterred by the laws of the politicians. In some instances, they're stopped by force by the police or they decide not to commit a crime for fear of what the police might do to them. What makes this deterrence work is not the legislation or the official badges, but the simple threat of harm to the sociopath. It really makes no difference whether the threat comes from the police or another citizen or even another criminal. A sociopath doesn't care about laws or social rules. He cares about avoiding pain and hardship for himself. This is still true when a government ruling class is not involved at all. If the intended target of a would-be carjacker pulls out a gun, it doesn't make any difference to the carjacker whether that person has a badge or whether there's a law against taking people's cars. Discouraging nasty people from hurting others does not require special authority only the ability to use defensive force. Ironically, though people hope that government will protect them, having a government, a gang which is believed to have the right to tax and control people, just creates one gang so big and powerful that normal people can't resist it. In short, to create a huge gang and then give it societal permission to control and extort people with the hope that this gang will prevent theft and thuggery is simply a self-contradictory idea, but that's what government always is. Some people might assume that if people organize for mutual protection and defense, then that's what government is. But there's an essential difference. People coming together to do something that everyone has the right to do, such as defend yourself, doesn't require any special authority. It's not government unless one group of people claims the right to do things which others do not have the right to do, such as taxing and controlling innocent people. Organized defense can be very effective without supposing the special right to rule over others, in other words, without being government. In contrast, Governments rob the people they rule of far more wealth than private crooks could ever manage, making the idea of a protector government ridiculous. Another common objection to the idea of a stateless society is the notion that, if not for a group of lawmakers telling the rest of us how to behave, we would all behave like stupid, irresponsible, violent animals. This claim implies one of two things. Either we normal people have no idea what is right and wrong unless and until politicians tell us, or the only reason we want to do the right thing and coexist peacefully is because politicians told us to. A quick examination of your own motivations will show you that neither of those things is actually true. It's particularly odd to make this argument in a society where politicians are voted into power. If the people themselves have no moral code and no conscience, and are just stupid, violent animals, why does almost everyone want government to keep the peace and protect the innocent? Would a population of vicious, heartless, evil people try to elect good people to keep the evil people in line? Obviously not. The goodness and the desire for order and peace comes from us, not from the lawmakers we vote into office. The same holds true of everything that government does. If people are so short-sighted and selfish that they can't be trusted to voluntarily organize and raise money for whatever they deem important, then how can those same people be trusted to decide who should be in power? 
The implication is that the average person can't be trusted to run his own life, but can be trusted to choose someone to run other people's lives. Government is really not a civilizing influence. It's actually an uncivilizing influence. People who would never personally rob their neighbors constantly use the government to do it for them by way of taxation. People who would never dream of trying to control minute details of their neighbors' lives think it's just fine to vote for politicians to do it instead. Government gives everyone the opportunity and encouragement to rob and control other people without risk. So government, rather than serving as a check against the imperfections of our nature, instead drastically amplifies our greed, irresponsibility, and malice towards other human beings by giving us a legally acceptable and risk-free way to interfere with the lives and choices of our fellow men and women. Government brings out the criminal and busybody in everyone. In contrast, in the absence of a ruling class, people would lose their ability to ask lawmakers to interfere with their neighbors' lives. And we would not have law enforcers who could avoid responsibility for evil deeds by claiming that they were just following orders. Throughout history, far more theft, assault, oppression, and even murder has been committed by those acting on behalf of a supposed authority than by anybody else. Even basically good people when they believe in government, will condone things or do things which they know would be wrong if they did them on their own. Most people know that theft and assault are bad, but they imagine that controlling their neighbors and forcing them to spend their money on things they don't want is perfectly moral and legitimate when it's done by way of the political process. Wrong becomes right when it's called taxation, legislation, regulation, and war. Anarchists know better. They know that human society will never be perfect, but it would be a whole lot better if evil deeds were committed only by genuinely nasty sociopathic people rather than being committed wholesale by basically good people who think that violent aggression is okay when it's called law enforcement. The fundamental principle of voluntarism is very simple. It's wrong to initiate violence against any other person, regardless of badges, laws, or alleged authority. The only time the use of force is justified is to defend against aggression. Almost everyone understands this on a personal level, but they've been taught that this basic rule of social living does not apply in the game of politics and government. Most people already know how to get along with others, and most people want a peaceful and just society. Our morality doesn't come from politicians making laws. Our ability to organize and cooperate doesn't come from the ruling class. When people escape the belief in government, they don't suddenly turn into violent animals. Our inherent right to defend ourselves and our ability to defend ourselves is not served by government. In fact, it's threatened by government more than by anything else. Ruling classes do not produce peaceful coexistence, but rather perpetual conflict and violence. Our belief in government authority takes our compassion, virtue, and good intentions and turns them into power for people who crave power and riches. Of course the people who benefit most from the political racket will put a good spin on the system and do their best to convince people that it's a social necessity. But ask yourself this, have the thousands of laws, regulations, and taxes imposed on you by politicians made you a better person? Have they made you more productive or more caring? Is the world better off with the politicians taking your money and telling you how to live your life or do you think it might have been better off if you'd been allowed to spend your own money and make your own decisions? Is society really best served by a small class of people forcefully imposing a centralized master plan on everyone else? 
Can the orders and threats of a ruling class make the world what it should be? Or would society be better served by human freedom and respect for individual rights, by voluntary cooperation and peaceful organization? If this second option sounds better to you, maybe you should learn more about anarchism. Some people dismiss anarchism as a utopian idea that would only work if everyone were generous and compassionate. Obviously, everyone is not generous and compassionate all the time. But these people need to look at the other side of the coin. If people are too stupid, greedy, and malicious to be free, aren't they too stupid, greedy, and malicious to be trusted with power over others? Whether people are inherently good, bad, or some of each, giving a person power over others is not going to make that person better. In fact, power has historically been known to corrupt people and make them worse, whereas the discipline imposed by the equal freedom of everyone else brings out the best in human nature. Most people today think that we need some form of government because they mistakenly believe that obedience to authority makes us all more civilized, moral, and peaceful. In reality, it has always done exactly the opposite. Everyone knows that governments can be corrupt, abusive, inefficient, counterproductive, even tyrannical. But most people assume that the way to fix that is to get the right people into power. People have spent centuries trying to create a good society using different kinds of ruling classes, different legal structures, different ways of choosing the rulers, and so on. But every governmental construction has resulted in freedom and riches for some, and oppression, violence, and poverty for others. What if, instead of deciding what the throne should look like, and who should sit on it, all people of goodwill embraced the non-aggression principle? What if instead of looking to a ruling class to impose our values on society, we embrace the concept of self-ownership? These principles are simple and easy, to the point of being self-evident, but they're diametrically opposed to the authoritarian principles that most of us have been indoctrinated with. Anarchism does not mean chaos and violence, or every man for himself. Having no government, does not mean having no morality, no organization, and no cooperation. Simply put, anarchism does mean that no one is your master and no one is your slave. And that's all it means. Howdy, Larkin Rose here. Uh, I'm feeling slightly less than entirely patient and polite today, so if this video gets slightly caustic, uh, too bad. This video is for all the people who are constantly saying, well, if not for government, we couldn't have roads, or we couldn't have police, or nobody would care for the poor, or we, couldn't, we wouldn't be protected, whether it's from, from local thugs or from, from foreign invaders. We wouldn't have this, we wouldn't have that. So thank goodness we have government and taxes, because we wouldn't have any of those things. And the first way I'd respond to that is by pointing out the assumptions that underlie that complaint, that, that, that argument. Basically what people are saying, because let's be clear about what the terms mean, government is the people who boss everybody else around. And taxes are those people demanding money from us. So they basically tell us, hand over a whole bunch of money and we'll decide how to take care of you. We'll decide how to spend your money. Uh, if we don't like it too bad, we don't really have a choice. Like, well, you can vote in a few years and maybe something will change, even though it totally won't. So that's what people are saying. Basically, if we didn't have a ruling class stealing our money and then supposedly spending it to protect us, how could we possibly have roads or anybody to protect us? The implication is that in this country, for example, 300 million people would just sit around thinking, oh, we just, we can't do it. Without politicians and tax collectors, we can't have a road, we can't protect each other, and we can't... And it, it rests on this bizarre assumption that things that almost everybody wants, they wouldn't do anything to make happen unless there were politicians 
forcing us to give them money so they can make it happen. And so an example I like to use is let's apply the same argument to food because food is pretty darn important. I think everybody can agree. Let's apply the same argument that, that statists use about the roads or caring for the poor or protection or anything like that. The argument would go like this. Now in the context of food, listen how idiotic this is. If we don't have government demanding money from all of us under the threat of caging us, and that's what taxation is, here's the money you have to give us, here's the nasty things we do to you if you don't. If that didn't happen so that they could build a big food production and distribution system and feed us, well, we'd all starve. We'd all just sit around saying, gosh, I wish we had food, but you know, no politicians and tax collectors. Uh, we're just going to sit around and starve to death. Now, in this country, nobody would believe something that stupid because all you have to do is go to a supermarket and see a perfect example of really efficient, organized cooperation that nobody is forced to do. There is no, you know, if you're going to make the argument that people make about roads and, and, and protection and all that, you'd say, well, nobody is forced to make any food for anybody in this country. How do you know everyone's just going to say, well, it's not my job, and we'll all starve to death. There's no guarantee. There's no master plan guaranteeing that we'll all have food. So obviously we're all going to starve if we don't have an authoritarian government stealing our money and then making food and giving it to us. Because golly gee, we couldn't possibly do it voluntarily ourselves. Again, in this country, nobody makes that argument because they see it happening voluntarily. Nobody involved is, is forced to do that. Nobody is forced to make you a single bite of food. There is no guarantee at all from anybody. And yet, Americans are, by and large, hugely overweight. Obviously, we don't have a lack of food. We might have a lack of healthy food. But obviously, we see that example, oh, we can handle that. You know, voluntarily, mutual cooperation, that's fine for food, but for some reason, it's not okay, and we can't even fathom the idea of the exact same thing handling roads, or handling protecting us, or other things that almost everybody wants. So there's, in the question is this bizarre assumption that everybody will sit around really, really, really wanting something, but because there aren't politicians bossing us around and stealing our money, well, how could we possibly do it? And one of the most common things is, who will build the roads? Which is amazingly stupid to me. Just amazingly stupid. I have here in my pocket a little tiny thing. With this little tiny thing, I can be most places in this country and call people all over the world. And I own it myself. I'm not anywhere near rich these days, but I own one. Almost everybody I know has one of these. A little thing that can fit in your pocket and just on a whim, you can open it and talk to somebody who's on the other side of the planet. And there was no coercion, nobody forced anybody to make one of these. This is the result of voluntary cooperation. And that's it. Free trade. Organization, yeah, good. Cooperation, yeah, good. Coercion, which is what government is, and taxation, which is theft, didn't need that to do this. So what these people are telling me, oh, we wouldn't have roads if we didn't have government is that somehow free individuals, relatively free, interacting voluntarily can make it so I can talk to almost anybody in the world on a little thing that fits in my pocket on a budget that is not a very good budget at the moment, but I still have one of these. That freedom, not authoritarianism, can supply me with this, but freedom cannot achieve a flat place because that's what a road is. It's a flat place from here to there because we have these machines that take us from here to there. By the way, we don't have those machines because of government. We have those machines because of free enterprise and voluntary interaction and cooperation. The idea that freedom can make a car but can't make a flat place is just idiotic. You really think we can't make a flat place? And, and so I ask people and they say, well, we'll build roads. Are you really telling me that you really and truly think that if government fell off the face of the earth, 300 million people in this country, 7 billion if you want to include the whole planet, would sit around in their houses thinking, golly, I wish I could go visit Fred, but eh, 
I can't because there's not a flat thing for me to him and I don't know how to do it and the other 300 million or 7 billion people we can't possibly do it because there aren't any politicians and tax collectors if they were here we could do it if they were here to boss us around and steal our money and really inefficiently build a flat place then we'd be set then I'd be comfortable and I could be confident that I could get places I could visit Fred, I could go shopping, but now we're all going to sit in our houses wishing we could go to the corner store, but we can't because, golly, how could we possibly make a flat place from here to there? We can make these, where you can talk to anybody in the world. We can make machines that you drive around in, but no, we couldn't possibly make a flat place. And when people say, well, who will build the roads? The first answer is the same damn people who do it now. Politicians and tax collectors don't build the friggin' roads. Have you ever seen one out there? No, you haven't. They steal our money, waste most of it, do all their corrupt games, and then they pay other people. Here's an idea. How about if we pay those other people who actually build the stinking road? And the fact that that doesn't occur to people is a great indication of how well indoctrinated people are by the rulers who will perpetually tell us you can't organize anything, you can't achieve anything, you can't do anything unless we are here to force it on you. And it's, again, there are a zillion examples, whether it's caring for the poor or protection or roads, obviously, where most of the population will say, I'm really concerned that poor people won't be taken care of, which means most of the population wants people in need to be taken care of. And if we didn't have politicians stealing our money, how would it happen? Here's an idea. Take some money out of your pocket and give it to one of the people that you think needs help. Why would you not comprehend that, but you would comprehend some guy a thousand miles away passing a law to send an armed thug to take your money, to waste 90% of it, and then give a little bit to somebody who may just be defrauding the system or may actually need it. And the amount of indoctrination required to make people even ask these questions of how could we possibly do this without government? What do you think government adds to the equation? It doesn't add any resources. It doesn't create anything. Everything it gives away, it steals from us first by way of taxation. It doesn't add any skills. It doesn't add any knowledge. The people who are here would still be here if the institution of government fell over. We have all the know-how, we have all the resources, all the technology. The only thing it adds is one group that's imagined to have the right to violently assault and control and extort everybody else. So what the question really means is, how can we have a road, or how could I help that poor, or how could that poor person be helped, or how would anybody protect us if there wasn't a gang of thugs with permission to violently control and rob us? And when you recognize that that is literally what the question means, you already see how utterly idiotic it is. And it's completely the result of authoritarian status indoctrination. Nobody would come up, on, come up with that on their own. And, and you obviously don't see that with the example of food or cars or cell phones or anything else. Nobody says, we won't be able to talk to each other unless there's a gang of thugs that's around, allowed to boss us around and steal our money. And just economically, how stupid do you have to be to think that's a good idea? Here are your choices. Let's do this. I'll give you these two choices for how you will be fed from now on. Either you can go spend your own money wherever you want. You can go to the supermarket or the local this or the local grocery, whatever you want. You can go decide what you want and they'll tell you the price. You decide what you're going to buy and how much. And, and you can go to different places and you can shop around and you can do all that. That's option number one. But let me warn you, option number one does not give any guarantee that you will be fed. There's no master plan forcing people to feed you. So, oh my gosh, you better be really scared of that option. Despite the fact that you can do it day after day and it works really darn well and feeds pretty much not only this country, but with a massive surplus. So that's option number one that apparently statists are scared of. Option number two is politicians will take as much money of yours as they decide to take. Then they will decide what, if anything, they will buy with that money in terms of food to give to you, to feed you. Do you really think that will serve you better, that that will feed you better? Yeah, I'm much more comfortable that I'll have a, a you know, I'll, I'll be fed, I'll be secure, everything will be okay if a gang of thugs 
who doesn't really care about me, steals my money and then decides what, if anything, to give me back from what they stole. But that is implied in the question, whatever you put in the blank, you know, how are we going to have blank if not for government? What you're saying is, how can we, the people who really want roads and food and cell phones and protection and all the things that almost everybody wants. How can we possibly have that unless we give someone permission to steal our money and boss us around and then decide what they're going to give us? And the same thing applies no matter what you put in the, the blank. How will we possibly do blank without government? Um, one of the silly ones is, is caring for the poor. How will we care for the poor? Think of what that means. Like people, it, when more than half the country votes for a party to take care of the poor. It's more than half of the country saying, we're really concerned and we want to make sure that the less fortunate are taken care of, but we don't believe that normal people acting in freedom will take care of them. Well, if the people didn't care about the poor, they wouldn't win the election. By definition, if you vote for a welfare state, you're an idiot. Because either people are heartless bastards and you're gonna lose, or people are compassionate in giving, and you don't need to win. Just give them your stinking money. But people play the game, and that's the Democratic Party lives off of the idiotic notion that you're all so heartless that you should vote for us to steal your money to give to the poor. And half the country falls for it. Yeah, we're all so heartless that we voted you into office for the specific purpose of taking our money to help the less fortunate. That's just freaking brilliant. How about if half the country just gave their stinking money to the less fortunate? And then the less fortunate would all be rich because it would be a trillion times more efficient than the government version of, of welfare ever is. Also, it would be actual charity instead of mass theft and corruption and fraud and all that fun stuff. But what takes the cake, the ultimately insane thing, you know, whatever you put in that gap, how can we have blank without a parasitic ruling class and a bunch of hired thieves. It's just a stupid question, but it's extra super stupid when what's in the blank is, how will we be protected? Who will protect us from thieves and robbers if we don't have government? It's the most idiotic question. It's also the most frequent question from statists. So here's what the question literally means. If we don't give a certain gang of people permission to violently control us and take our money under threat of putting us in a cage, who will protect us from people who might commit aggression against us and take our money? Wanting government for that is exactly as brilliant as saying, we have to have a carjacker in our town, otherwise somebody might steal our cars. Government is an appointed thief. If you don't think taxation is theft, first of all, you're a really well-trained slave. Second of all, try not paying. See what happens. See if they say, oh, it's quite all right. Or if they say, no, you're going to pay or we're going to take your stuff or eventually we'll put you in a cage. And when people say, that's not theft because we get something back. Learn to think. And I use this example all the time and all I ever get is stupid looks from statists in response. If I robbed you at gunpoint of 100 bucks and the next day I gave you a sandwich, and he said, what? I said, hey, now everything's fine because you benefited. I gave you a, a service. I, I gave you lunch. So that retroactively makes it okay that I robbed you at gunpoint. Would you buy that argument? No, you'd say, that doesn't make it okay. Okay, you gave me a sandwich. And yet every status makes the exact same argument when it comes to government. Will we get some stuff for it after they demand our money under threat of violence and putting us in a cage? Then we get services or goods. We don't get what we asked for, and we get lots of things we didn't ask for, but we kind of get something, and that retroactively makes it okay for them to say, give us this much of every paycheck you make, or we're sending men with guns to take your property. And the slaves justify their own enslavement. I'm proud to pay my taxes. I'm proud to get robbed by a parasitic ruling class and get a little bit back and feel good about it. Like, not only is that legitimate and justified, but I feel proud that I let myself get robbed by a bunch of crooks and parasites. But again, the ultimate thing is protection. When people say, who will protect us from aggressors and thugs and thieves? 
if we don't have a government, even though what government is, by its very nature, is a gang of aggressors and thugs and thieves. They issue commands, every law they pass is a command backed by a threat of violence. You have to do this, you're not allowed to do that, here are the nasty things we will do to you if you, are get, if you get caught disobeying. I mean, everybody knows that, even though it's, they don't usually say it in terms that blunt and honest and accurate. But to say we need taxes to be protected is as stupid as you can get. It's saying we need theft to avoid theft. And the fact that people are trained to use different words so that this theft sounds okay, it's legalized, it's taxation, and we voted for the people who robbed us. Like, we got to elect our local carjacker, and that means he represents us when he demands our car and points a gun in our face. He's serving us as he steals our car because he's going to use that car and sell it and make money to make sure nobody else steals our car. That is the essence of government. And the fact that you have hundreds of millions of victims of that scam vehemently defending it and saying, I, I'm not going to give that up. I don't want to give up government. Who would protect us? I don't want to give up the biggest aggressor on the planet, the biggest thief on the planet. Look at your tax bill and see how much private crooks steal from you. So before you ask that question, before you ask how could we possibly have roads or protection or water or air or Christmas or Santa Claus or any of the zillion things that statists imagine we can't possibly have without a, a ruling class, think about what the question actually means. Because when you get to the point where you understand the implications of your own question, asking how can we possibly have this without a parasitic gang of thugs robbing us, when you actually understand what you're really asking, you won't ask the question because you will realize it's completely freaking idiotic. Hey, Larkin Rose here. Uh, one of the first things that people are concerned about when they start thinking about a society without a ruling class is, well, what happens to the nasty people? Uh, whether you're talking about people who are just kind of negligent or inconsiderate, uh, play their music too loud at night or leave their trash lying around the woods or whatever it is, um, all the way up to people who run around attacking and murdering people. So people say, well, well what would happen to them? What would we do about that? Uh, some people even go so far as to say, if not for government, there would be nothing to stop people from committing murder and, and doing whatever other nasty stuff. And it's funny because when somebody says that, there would be no consequences, they could do whatever they wanted and nobody would stop them. The person saying that is implying that he isn't going to do anything. If there's someone running around attacking and murdering innocent people, the guy who said nothing will happen to them, obviously he's not going to do anything or something would happen to them. But not only is he demonstrating his own cowardice when he said there would be nothing to stop murderers, he's also projecting his own immaturity and irresponsibility onto the rest of the world because he's also saying the other 7 billion people wouldn't do anything about it, which obviously isn't true. I would, wouldn't you? If somebody was running around murdering your neighbors, would you just go, oh, there aren't politicians and there's nobody with a badge and we don't have tax collectors and bureaucrats, so, oh well, I guess they're just out of luck, they're going to get murdered. Uh, and would, would you not even protect yourself if there wasn't government? Obviously, lots and lots of people, all the same people, would do whatever they could to protect themselves and, and defend the innocent. Uh, to, so to say nothing would happen is just really bizarre. And it comes from having a mentality, basically, of a little kid in a classroom where the teacher walks out of the room and the kids are just sitting there, we don't know what to do. No authority is telling us what to do. And Johnny's throwing things at me, and there's no teacher to stop him! Ah! Because most people, having been trained into authoritarian mentality, it never occurs to them that they are the ones who should fix anything, who should stop anything. And so when people say, well, what would be done about this and that and the other thing, nasty people doing nasty things, um, the first the first thing I ask is, well, what would you do about it? Because people are so into the mentality that, there's have to be some, that there has to be some master plan and some authority who writes down the law of here is what will be done with those people that people don't think in terms of, well, what would I do about it? 
which is why I always ask people, well, what would you do about it? You're a person just as much as me and just as much as the other seven billion. What would you feel justified in doing if somebody was polluting or playing their music too loud at night or running around murdering people or whatever in between you can think of? Any nasty thing, what would you feel justified in doing about it? Because there's a very basic rule of being a moral human being, which is if it would be wrong for you to do something, don't ask anybody else to do it. And the rule is so simple, so self-evident and obvious that most people will go, well, duh, of course. Trouble is, nobody in the world who believes in government abides by that rule. Nobody. I don't care if you're a constitutionalist, Democrat, Republican, fascist, communist, anything, any kind of statist. There is nobody who believes in government who abides by the most basic rule of morality, which is if it's wrong for you to do something, don't ask somebody else to do it. Because every single candidate, every party, every government always does things that the voters know they themselves have no right to do. And to say something like, well, I'm voting for the guy who's going to tax you less. Well, do you have the right to rob me a little bit less than the other guy? No, you don't. So telling me that, well, somebody was going to rob you more, but I voted for the guy to rob you a little bit less. You are still violating the basic rule of being a human being. If it's wrong for you, don't ask somebody else to do it. Uh, well, that's kind of the second basic rule, the first one being the non-aggression principle. And they actually go together quite well. But when people are in the mindset that there's going to be some major centralized plan to, to deal with whatever, polluters or people who play their music too loud or murderers or whatever else, they have to get out of that mindset. They have to start to think that maybe they are among the people who have to do something about it. So instead of setting what will be done about such and such, well, what will you do about it? What should I do about it? And this doesn't, this doesn't magically make all the problems go away, but the actual practical challenge of dealing with most disputes is trivial compared to the challenge of getting people to think like responsible adults, where they start to think, well, maybe it's up to me. And a while back I did uh, little events called uh, Escaping the Myth, and one of the little mental exercises I did with these little groups of people is, imagine we're on an island, and we're it. There's no government, there's no authority, there's nobody with a badge, and one of us is running around stealing stuff from other people. He's not killing anybody, but he's stealing stuff, what are we going to do about it? We normal people. There's not a legislature. There's not 911 to call. There's nobody with a badge. It's just people. And so with that specific example, I would ask people, so what do we do? And just off the top of their heads, everybody comes up with solutions that are way better than what government ever does. First of all, every government solution is, all right, step one, I get to rob everybody. That's the government solution. Well, we're going to tax everybody so we have the resources to stop that other robber. Well, in the island scenario, nobody is stupid enough or insane enough to start with that, to say, well, let's see, so somebody's stealing our stuff. Okay, first, I get to rob all of you so that I have the resources to protect you from him. Nobody is that insane. Everybody is insane enough to believe that who believes in government. And I did for many years. I was stupid enough to actually think that it was rational and moral to advocate mass extortion in order to protect people. And that's just stupid. So I just believed something insanely stupid for a very long time. Most of the world still believes that. But in a setting where people are, are put on the spot and they're responsible for what happens, they don't do that. They don't say, well, I get to boss everybody around and take their money. Nobody does that. So to me, the challenge is not even coming up with specific solutions to every imaginable uh, dispute or problem, which I don't pretend to know how everything's going to turn out, and I don't intend to be emperor of anarchy. I'm not going to be in charge of the world. But getting people to the mindset where it's up to them, where there's just people, we're it. No legislatures, no people with badges, no authority. We're just people. Suddenly people are way better at solving problems and making things work. Uh, one good example is when there's a, a disaster. Unfortunately, um, sometimes it takes a horrendous event to bring out the best in people. And it brings out the worst in some people too. But when people say, whoa, my neighbor's house is floating away, I'm not going to wait for FEMA. I'm not going to dial 911. I'm going to jump in a boat and go save him. Because suddenly it's on me. Suddenly I'm the one who has to do something. 
And when people, when it occurs to people that they're the ones who have to do something, and unfortunately, usually that only happens in a complete disaster area, when it occurs to people and they suddenly take on the responsibility and start to think like adults, their solutions are generally a lot better than any government solutions and ever are. But to get to that mentality, people have to shift from the authoritarian mindset to the mindset of a self-owning individual who realizes there is nothing above me. There is no magic unicorn who's going to come to save the day, who's going to come save me from, from polluters or somebody playing their music too loud or murderers or whatever it is. It's just us. And if we realize that, then first of all, people would stop asking me, well, without a government, how would this be handled? As if I'm going to be in charge. I don't freaking know. What would you do about it? I can tell you what I would do about it. I could tell you what I might suggest, what I might predict, but who cares? I'm one of seven billion people. I'm not going to be in charge any more than you are. So it's really a mental exercise that people have to think, think over in their own heads with their own moral codes instead of waiting for some outside answer. And it's why I don't usually get into those discussions of, well, here's my plan for how to deal with this and that and the other thing, because my plan doesn't matter. My plan will not be the best plan for any problem you can come up with. There will be a million people with better plans than whatever I could come up with. So don't ask me to describe how you are going to fix problems. I don't freaking know. And you can see the mind shift um, in people when they, they grasp that they own themselves and they suddenly realize, oh, okay, well, yeah, there are things we can do to settle disputes, to protect ourselves from attackers, to do this or that or the other thing. But the first step is just grow up. Stop thinking it's somebody else's business to make the world work. Well, how will the poor be cared for? I don't know, what are you gonna do? Well, how will we be protected from this? I don't know, what are you gonna do about it? And there is, it is inconvenient. It's inconvenient to be a free person where you can't just be a kid in the classroom whining to the teacher to save the day and fix everything and make everything work where you actually have to be a responsible adult. And that's one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why people like the belief in authority, because then they can live with the lie that all they have to do is obey and do as they're told and everything will be okay. First of all, no, it won't be okay. Second of all, you're not even being a human being. You just threw your free will out the window and became somebody's slave in the hopes that that would help humanity. It doesn't help humanity for you to be a slave. It doesn't help humanity for everybody else to be a slave. It does help humanity for you to start thinking as an adult, responsible human being who owns himself and who accepts that it is your responsibility to figure out how to make the world work. You cannot begin to imagine in how many ways the world is the opposite of what you have been taught to believe. You see the guy who sells drugs to willing customers so he can feed his family as the scum of the earth, while you see the hypocrite who gives away stolen money in the name of government as a saint. You see the guy who tries to avoid being robbed by the federal thugs as a crook and a tax cheat but see as virtuous the politician who gives away the same stolen loot to people to whom it does not belong. You see the cop as a good guy when he drags a man away from his friends and family and throws him in prison for 10 years for smoking a leaf. And you see anyone who defends himself from such barbaric fascism as the lowest form of life, a cop killer. In reality, most drug dealers are more virtuous than any government social worker and prostitutes have far less to be ashamed of than political whores because they trade only with what is rightfully theirs and only with those who want to trade with them. The upstanding, church-going, law-abiding, tax-paying citizen who votes Democrat or Republican is far more despicable and a bigger threat to humanity than the most promiscuous, lazy, drug-snorting hippie. Why? because the hippie is willing to let others be free and the voter is not.
the damage done to society by bad habits and loose morality is nothing compared to the damage done to society by the self-righteous violence committed in the name of the state. You imagine yourselves to be charitable and tolerant when you are nothing of the sort. Even the Nazis had table manners and proper etiquette when they weren't killing people. You think you're good people because you say please and thank you? You think sitting in that big building on Sunday makes you noble and righteous? The difference between you and a common thief is that the thief has the honesty to commit the crime himself while you whine for government to do your stealing for you. The difference between you and the street thug is that the thug is open about the violence he commits while you let others forcibly control your neighbors on your behalf. You advocate theft, harassment, assault, and even murder, but accept no responsibility for doing so. You old folks want the government to steal from your kids so you can get your monthly check. You parents want all your neighbors to be robbed to pay for your kids' schooling. You all vote for whichever crook promises to steal money from other people to pay for what you want. You demand that those people who engage in behaviors you don't approve of be dragged off and locked up, but feel no guilt for the countless lives your whims have destroyed. You even call the government thugs your representatives, and yet you never take responsibility for the evil they commit. You proudly support the troops as they kill whomever the liars in D.C. tell them to kill, and you feel good about it. You call yourselves Christians or Jews or claim to follow some other religion, but the truth is what you call your religion is empty window dressing. What you truly worship, the God you really bow to, what you really believe in is the state. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not murder, unless you can do it by way of government. Then it's just fine, isn't it? If you call it taxation and war, it stops being a sin, right? After all, it was only your God that said you shouldn't steal and murder, but the state said it was okay. It's pretty obvious which one outranks the other in your minds. Despite all the churches, synagogues, and mosques we see around us, this nation has one God, and only one God, and that God is called government. Jesus taught nonviolence and told you to love your neighbor. But the state encourages you to vote for people who will use the violence of government to butt into every aspect of everyone else's life. Which do you believe? To those about to stone a woman who had committed adultery, Jesus said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. But the state says it's perfectly fine to lock someone up if they do something you find distasteful, such as prostitution. Which do you believe? The Christian God says, Thou shalt not covet, but coveting is the lifeblood of the beast that is the state. You are taught to resent, despise, and hate anyone who has anything you don't have. You clamor for the state to tear other people down, steal their property, and give it to you. And you call that fairness. The Bible calls it coveting and stealing. You are not Christians. You are not Jews. You are not Muslims. And you certainly aren't atheists. You all have the same God, and its name is government. You're all members of the most evil, insane, destructive cult in history. If there ever was a devil, the state is it, and you worship it with all your heart and soul. You pray to it to solve every problem, to satisfy all your needs, to smite your enemies, and to shower its blessings upon you. You worship what Nietzsche called the coldest of all cold monsters, and you hate those of us who don't. To you, the greatest sin is disobeying your God, breaking the law, you call it, as if anyone could possibly have any moral obligation to obey the arbitrary commands and demands of the corrupt, lying, delusional megalomaniacs who infest this despicable town. Even your ministers, priests, and rabbis, more often than not, are traitors to their own religions, teaching that the commands of human authority should supersede adherence to the laws of the gods they say they believe in. Several years ago, I heard one pompous evangelical jackass in particular pontificating on the radio that anyone who disobeys the civil authority, be it a king or any other government, is engaging in rebellion against God. Those were the exact words he used. What if the government is doing something wrong? 
well this salesman for Satan opined. That is the business of those in government, and you are still obligated to obey. Everywhere you turn, be it the state or the church, the media or the schools, you are taught one thing above all else, the virtue of subjugating yourselves to mortals who claim to have the right to rule you. It is sickening the reverence with which you speak of the liars and thieves whose feet are so firmly planted on your necks. You call the congressmen and the judges honorable and you swoon at the magnificence of the grandiose halls they inhabit, the temples they built to celebrate the domination of mankind. You feel pride at being able to say you once shook a senator's hand or saw the president in person. Ah yes, the grand deity himself, his royal highness, the president of the United States of America. You speak the title as if you're referring to God Almighty. The vocabulary has changed a bit, but your mindset is no different from that of the groveling peasants of old who bowed low, faces in the dirt, with a feeling of unworthiness and humility when in the presence of whatever narcissist had declared himself to be their rightful lord and master. The truth of the matter, back then and today, is that these parasites who call themselves leaders are not superior beings. They are not great men and women. They are not honorable. They're not even average. The people who earn an honest living, from sophisticated millionaire entrepreneurs to illiterate day laborers doing the most menial tasks you can imagine, those people deserve your respect. Those people you should treat with courtesy and civility. But the frauds who claim the right to rule you and demand your subservience and obedience, they deserve only your scorn and contempt. Those who seek so-called high office are the lowest of the low. They may dress better, have larger vocabularies, and do a better job of planning out and executing their schemes, but they are no better than pickpockets, muggers, and carjackers. In fact, they are worse, because they don't want to rob you of just your possessions. They want to rob you of your very humanity, deprive you of your free will, by slowly leeching away your ability to think, to judge, to act, reducing you to slaves in both body and mind. And still you persist in calling them leaders. Leaders? Where is it that you think you're going exactly that would require you to have a leader? If you just live your own life and mind your own damn business, exercising your own talents, pursuing your own dreams, striving to be what you believe you should be, what possible use would you have for a leader? Do you ever actually think about the words that you hear, the words that you repeat? You parrot oxymoronic terms such as the leader of the free world, even pretending for a moment that there is some huge journey or some giant battle that everyone in the entire nation is undertaking together that would require a leader, why would you ever think, even for a moment, that the crooks that infest this town are the sort of people you should listen to or emulate or follow anywhere? Somewhere inside your mostly dormant brains, you know full well that politicians are all corrupt liars and thieves, opportunistic con men, exploiters and fear mongers. You know all this. And yet you still speak as if you are the ones who are the stupid, vicious animals, while the politicians are the great, wise role models, teachers and leaders, without whom civilization could not exist. You think these crooks are the ones who make civilization possible? What belief could be more absurd? Yet when they do their pseudo-religious rituals, deciding how to control you this week, you still call it law and continue to treat their arbitrary demands as if they were moral decrees from the gods that no decent person would ever consider disobeying. You have become so thoroughly indoctrinated into the cult of state worship that you are truly shocked when the occasional sane person states the bleeding obvious. The mere fact that the political crooks wrote something down and declared their threats to be law does not mean that any human being anywhere has the slightest moral obligation to obey. Every moment of every day, in every location and every situation, you have a moral obligation to do what you deem to be right, not what some delusional bloated windbag says is legal. 
And that requires you to first determine right and wrong for yourself, a responsibility you spend much time and effort trying to dodge. You proclaim how proud you are to be law-abiding citizens and express your utter contempt for anyone who considers himself above your so-called laws. Laws that are nothing more than the selfish whims of tyrants and thieves. The word crime once meant an act harmful to another person. Now it means disobedience to any one of the myriad of arbitrary commands coming from a parasitical criminal class. To you, the term crime is nearly synonymous with the word sin, implying that the ones whose commands are being disobeyed must be something akin to gods, when in truth they are more akin to leeches. The very phrase, taking the law into your own hands, perfectly expresses what a sacrilege it is in your eyes for a mere human being to take upon himself the responsibility to judge right from wrong and to act accordingly instead of doing what you do, unthinkingly obeying whatever capricious commands this cesspool of maggots spews forth. You glorify this criminal class as lawmakers and believe that no one is lower than a lawbreaker, someone who would dare disobey the politicians. Likewise, you speak with pious reverence of law enforcers, those who forcibly impose the politicians every whim upon the rest of us. When the state uses violence, you imagine it to be inherently righteous and just, and if anyone resists, they are, in your eyes, contemptible lowlifes, lawless terrorist criminals. Like the lawless terrorist criminals who helped slaves escape the plantations. Like the lawless terrorist criminals who helped Jews escape the killing machine of the Third Reich. Like the lawless terrorist criminals who were crushed to death under the tanks of the Red Chinese government in Tiananmen Square. Like all the lawless terrorist criminals in history who had the courage to disobey the never-ending stream of tyrants and oppressors who have called their violence authority and law. And that includes the lawless terrorist criminals who founded this country. Everything you think you know is upside down, backwards, and inside out. But what has to take the cake, the height of your insanity, is the fact that you view as violent terrorists the only people on the planet who oppose the initiation of violence against their fellow men. Anarchists, voluntarists, and libertarians. We use violence only to defend ourselves against someone who initiates violence against us. We use it for nothing else. Meanwhile, your belief system is completely schizophrenic and self-contradictory. On the one hand, you teach the young slaves that violence is never the answer. Yet out of the other side of your mouths, you advocate that everyone and everything, everywhere and at all times, be controlled, monitored, taxed and regulated through the force of government. In short, you are teaching your children that the masters may use violence whenever they please, but the slave should never resist. You indoctrinate your children into a life of unthinking, helpless subservience. You are putting the chains around their little necks and fastening the locks tight. And worst of all, you feel good about it. Out of one side of your mouths, you condemn the evils of fascism and socialism and lament the injustices of the regimes of Hitler, Stalin and Mao. While out of the other side of your mouths, you preach exactly what they did. The worship of the collective, the subjugation of every individual to that evil insanity that wears the deceptive label, the common good. You babble on and on about diversity and open-mindedness and then beg your masters to regulate and control every aspect of everyone's lives, creating a giant herd of unthinking conformist drones. You wear different clothes and have different hairstyles and you think that makes you different. Yet all your minds are enslaved to the same club of masters and controllers. You think what they tell you to think and do what they tell you to do while imagining yourselves to be progressive, thinking and enlightened. From your position of relative comfort and safety, you now condemn the evils of other lands and other times while turning a blind eye to the injustices happening right in front of you. 
you tell yourself that had you lived in those other places, in those other times, you would have been among those who stood up against oppression and defended the downtrodden. But that is a lie. You would have been right there with the rest of the flock of well-trained sheep, loudly demanding that the slaves be beaten, that the witches be burned, that the nonconformists and rebels be destroyed. How do I know this? Because that is exactly what you are doing today. Today's injustices and oppressions are fashionable and popular, and those who resist them, you tell yourselves, are just malcontents and freaks, people whose rights don't matter, people who deserve to be crushed under the boot of authority. Isn't that right? You bunch of spineless, unthinking hypocrites, look in the mirror. Take a good look at what you imagine to be righteous and kind. You are the devil's plaything. The crowds of thousands wildly applauding the speeches of Adolf Hitler, that was you. The mob demanding that Jesus Christ be nailed to the cross, that was you. The white invaders who celebrated the wholesale slaughter of those godless redskins, that was you. The throngs filling the Colosseum, applauding as the Christians were fed to the lions, that was you. Throughout history, the perpetual suffering and injustice occurring on an incomprehensible scale, it was all because of people just like you. The well-trained, thoroughly indoctrinated conformists, the people who do as they're told, who proudly bow to their masters, who follow the crowd, believing what everyone else believes and thinking whatever authority tells them to think, that is you. And your ignorance is not because the truth is not available to you. There have been radicals preaching it for thousands of years. No, you are ignorant because you shun the truth with all your heart and soul. You close your eyes and run away when a hint of reality lands in front of you. You condemn as extremists and fringe kooks those who try to show you the chains you wear because you don't want to be free. You don't even want to be human. Responsibility and reality scare the hell out of you so you cling tightly to your own enslavement and lash out at any who seek to free you from it. When someone opens the door to your cage, you cower back in the corner and yell, close it, close it. Well, some of us are finished with trying to save you. We've wasted enough effort trying to convince you that you should be free. All you ever do is spout back what your masters have taught you, that being free only leads to chaos and destruction, while being obedient and subservient leads to peace and prosperity. There are none so blind as those who will not see. And you, you nation of sheep, would rather die than see the truth. There is something I need you to do, favorite, like and share this video. Now that you have done that, go to your browser add-ons, download YouTube video downloader, come back to this video and save the video to your computer and upload it your YouTube channel. Use a different title than the one used for this video. Please follow those instructions and other video on your YouTube channel to help spread the message. If you did not understand the instructions to download videos from YouTube look it up on YouTube. There are some YouTube videos explaining on how to do so it's very easy. If you do not host this video on the account you are not doing your part to get the message out there and you are part of the problem. And thanks for watching. Anonymous now has a new YouTube channel it is called Anarchy World. To find our new YouTube channel you need to type in Anarchy World in the official YouTube search bar.
There are no spaces in Anarchy World. Do not type it in the address bar because you will find a different YouTube channel called Anarchy World. So and here are the people responsible for the current corruption. You should remember the names for when shit hits the fan.